Hello and welcome to another edition of Rory On Air. On this episode, I'm going to take a detailed review of my near miss at Slape Airfield, which featured on my most recent video, and go through some of your comments and questions that you've left for me here on YouTube. That's coming up shortly, but first, it's World Helicopter Day, so I couldn't resist a quick trip to Manchester Barton to check out some of the choppers. Well, hello and welcome to my house. Uh, that was a nice little outing this morning to Barton to see some of the chopper activity going on in World Helicopter Day. But the focus of this video is not actually about choppers, but more about the near miss that I had um, on my previous video at Slape Airfield in Shropshire when I was flying down there with my mate Jolon. Um, the video's had over 11,000 views to date on YouTube and quite a lot of people have been getting in touch via comments and messages on my Rory On Air Facebook page um, to offer their opinions on what happened and to ask some questions about what happened and look for a bit more clarity and some detail on certain things. So I thought it'd be useful and interesting to go through some of those questions from you guys and kind of give you some answers and there's been about four or five general themes through the YouTube comments and I'm not going to go through every single comment because it's going to take too long. Um, so I thought I'd go through some of the kind of general groups of questions. The first one is about clarity. Now, I edited the video when I was up in Orkney on holiday and I had other things on my mind and I was trying to do it relatively quickly. So I didn't actually include um, a kind of map or chart showing where I was and where I was in relation to other aircraft and the airfield and all the rest of it, which with hindsight would have been useful to help you guys understand what the circumstances were. So I'm including a chart in this. Um, as you can see from this chart, which is up on screen now, um, this is actually a log from my Sky Demon, which I run on my iPad um, on my knee, and it shows that I was flying a pretty tight circuit and making a left-hand circuit because that's what they were operating from runway 18 at Slape on that day. So I took off facing south, made a, a left climbing turn onto a kind of sort of a crosswind leg, although it very quickly became the downwind leg. And I was more or less established on downwind, still climbing through 900 feet up to about 1,000 feet for the circuit uh, when... Joel on my passenger spotted the other aircraft which we'd been looking for because I'd heard them on the radio um, but as I say several of you are asking for clarity about that Owen Wright um, he says I've just started flying from Slape and have been taught to fly the circuit on departure which is what you were doing too slightly difficult to tell from the video but it looks as though the conflicting aircraft was either flying the wrong way around the circuit or was cutting across you to join downwind late. Well, they definitely weren't flying the wrong way around the circuit. I know that for two reasons, and we'll come on to that in future, but I, I know they weren't flying the wrong way. They were doing a correct standard overhead join. Um, and of course, with that, the idea is that you would conform and turn behind aircraft that are already established in the circuit. Um, I think that's where things came slightly unstuck. But again, that may be something to do with the fact that I was flying a tight circuit, but we'll come on to that as well. Uh, Mr. Always Blue says, it's difficult to visualise yours and the other aircraft's position in the circuit at the time. Would be useful to see a map of some positions. Maybe your Sky Demon overlay would be useful. Well, we're having a look at that now. Uh, ben Atkinson. Hi, Ben. He says, great video, Rory. So are you just starting downwind leg and he's coming across to join crosswind? Looking forward to a bonus mini episode on a debrief with a biro scribble diagrams. Uh, well, this is what this is. This is the idea of this episode is a kind of debrief on what happened and what I can learn from this that will be useful going forward and to kind of give you guys a little bit more clarity as well. Um, and his comment about biro scribble drawing brings me on nicely to a comment from one of my other um, regular YouTube viewers, JP Hughes. Hi, JP. 
he says, is this what happened? And has sent me a drawing that he's done with pen of what he thinks happened. And actually, to be fair, JP, you're pretty much spot on. It's been pointed out by several comments that my circuit was quite tight. Mark Sumner, he says, did you fly an oval circuit instead of a square on slate departure? Question mark. Certainly looked like a nearly continuous turn and a really close in downwind leg. If I was finishing the overhead join crossing the downwind of a square circuit, I'd be expecting to have seen you much further to my right, expecting you to have climbed on runway track, then turn to fly a crosswind leg parallel to my joining track and I'd have been looking for you somewhere off to my right around the start of the downwind. I certainly wouldn't be expecting you to be so close in, almost dead ahead, as you'd flown a climbing 180 instead. Nice job with the avoiding action, no harm done. Good decision to fly uh, low to and, and a civilised radio call. Well, thank you, Mark, for that comment. Um, I, I can completely see where people are coming from on this, and actually, to be fair, with hindsight... And, and again, from the review of this, maybe I was being a bit sort of aggressively tight in my circuit flying. Um, another comment here from Nomad Aviation. He says, your position at the start of your downwind leg was less than half a mile east from runway 18 centerline at 900 feet. The circuit is further out to the east, approximately one mile at 1,000 feet. The other aircraft should be crossing the 36 threshold 1,000 feet west to east he'd be looking for you further out to the east. Your aircraft performance allowed you to reach circuit height almost and downwind direction, if not correct ground track simultaneously, therefore a high workload. As said before, extending the takeoff climb on runway direction before turning would make the departure safer. Um, yeah, again, a fair point. I think I think probably I, I probably was flying a bit too tight on the circuit and, and I will do a bit less of that in future. In my defence though, and I've, I've actually had a chat with one of my instructors this afternoon when I was up at the airfield for World Heli Day, and he said that he teaches students to be able to glide back to the airfield from any position in the circuit, probably not on actual climb out because then you'd be doing the, the old dangerous 180 turn, but you know, from the, from the crosswind leg potentially, certainly from the downwind leg, even if you were doing sort of a downwind landing you'd still be able to make the runway if you didn't fly too wide a circuit um, and obviously I had two other things on my mind that I feel are kind of mitigating circumstances in this case as well one was I was intending to fly a northerly track so I wanted to kind of get onto my northerly course as quickly as possible and the reason why I wanted to get on as quickly as possible is because I knew that my passenger Jolon was struggling a fair bit with air sickness. We'd flown down from Barton, we'd overflown his house in Shropshire and we stopped at Slate. And I deliberately made sure that we'd stopped at Slate for a considerable length of time to make sure that he could kind of recuperate and we had something to eat and we had some cups of tea and stuff and a bit of a relax. So he was ready to go again, but I knew that we had a you know, a journey of at least 40 minutes back to Barton and it would potentially be quite bumpy up the low level route and around Barton given the fact that it was later in the day and it would be warmer and there'd be more thermals and stuff. So I was keen to minimise the amount of mucking around at Slate and try and get back reasonably quickly so that there was more chance of me getting him back on, on deck at Barton without any incidents. So that was, in, in terms of the human factors of this incident, that was playing on my mind. Um... Just looking through some of these other comments, Craig O'Brien, he says, I normally just fly runway heading to escape the circuit. Um, this is an interesting one, Craig, because I'm not really aware of any particular rules about this. Obviously, if you were intending, in my view, to fly south and you were taking off on runway 18, so you were heading south anyway, you would just continue on runway heading. You'd leave the ATZ, you'd make a radio call but in my case, I wanted to go in the opposite direction to the direction that we were taking off from. So I've been taught to fly a circuit and depart from the circuit pattern on whichever leg makes most sense. In the case of wanting to fly north in the instance of this case, that would be effectively at the end of the downwind leg. Instead of turning left again onto base, I would just continue flying north and depart the ATZ at that point. So that's what I'm used to, um, and as I say, my instructor said that it's a good idea to be able to glide back to the airfield, so you want to keep the circuits relatively tight. Um, let's move on to the next thing then. Um, Sting Island says, hi Rory, just an idea. You knew he was out there but didn't have sight. A quick position report might have helped. Well, thank you, John. Um, 
Good suggestion. I, again, normally, if I was to take off from Barton and fly a circuit, I wouldn't make a radio call after my taking off Golf Oscar Alpha call. I wouldn't make another radio call until I was established on downwind, at which point I'd say Golf Oscar Alpha, downwind, touch and go, or to land. Um, so I wouldn't normally make a position report. Obviously, you can make position reports when you want, and and I think John's made a fair point. I did know this aircraft was in the vicinity because I'd heard them calling, um, joining overhead and dead side descending and what have you. So I was looking out for them, but still couldn't see them. So perhaps a position report would have been a good idea. Good suggestion. Um, and Gate 2000 says, stop talking and listen to your radio and concentrate on your flying. A missed call is probably the cause of your near miss. This is an interesting one, and I do understand what you're coming from. I make these YouTube videos to try and make them as entertaining as possible, and I find videos where there's no chat and there's just engine noise and people looking out the window not as watchable. So I cut out nearly all the parts of my videos where there's no chat. So it does, from a viewer's point of view, probably look like, for the entire duration of my flight, I'm giving it this the whole time. That is not actually the case. I just cut those bits of dead air out because as a radio person, dead air is a sin, we say in broadcasting. So I try and avoid it. Having listened back to the tape very carefully, I don't believe I did miss any radio calls. So I don't really think that is entirely the cause of this issue at all, but it's a fair point. And um, Phil Smith says, could you use a pilot aware? Um, and then if you did, you'd know exactly where the other plane is. Again, good point. Um, pilot aware is something that I'm really interested in. Um, we've been using electronic conspicuity um, at Barton for a while now on an ADSB trial. I haven't so far managed to get the um, Sky Echo unit to connect to my iPad, um, which I'm going to look at again because I think it would be really useful. Um, and if I had have had that working, I may well have been able to see where this aircraft was had they been you know, showing up on the system, which not all do, because not everyone's equipped with the equipment that you need to have. So that is a kind of a different topic in itself about electronic conspicuity. I'm all in favour of it, and I think it's a really good idea, and I think everyone should be using it. Uh, Jonathan Griffiths says, uh, nickname your oppo Hawkeyes. He should consider a career as a fighter pilot with that eyesight. <laughs> True, Jolon did do very well spotting aircraft he, he later spotted the red arrows um flying in formation much lower than us on our way back to barton um keeping a good look out mark one eyeball is absolutely critical and we were looking i saw the shadow of the aircraft couldn't actually spot it and i think part of the reason why i couldn't see them initially is because they were right in the line between the ground and the sky and that just made it quite difficult for me to see them so um lots of things to consider there uh, which way should I have turned when I saw the other aircraft? This is an interesting one as well. Laird Bufflehead, interesting YouTube name, says, Personally, I think I'd have handled it exactly the way you did. From what I could see, turning left and climbing wouldn't work as you don't have enough power to climb fast enough to clear. Also, you'd most likely turn directly into their path and have not cleared it. Also, if the other aircraft still hadn't seen you, they wouldn't have had a reason to turn and would have continued straight into your path. A descending right turn on full power in this case took you away faster and also exposed more surface area for the other aircraft to see and avoid. Pulling back on the controls on full power to avoid an aircraft can easily cause enough distraction to lose too much speed and cause a power on stall and spin. So all true, good points. I think I probably would have been able to outclimb that situation in the Eurostar because it is such a capable aircraft and is so powerful but we don't know. So I guess we'll just leave that one there. I kind of feel that it's one of those things that you just make an instant decision at the time. And in this case, it worked out okay. Um, am I going to file an Airprox report is basically another question. Pilot George asked that question. Dale Edwards says, great video. Thank you, Dale. He says, um, I'm curious if you filed an Airprox for this. Given the distance and altitude, it seems this would have been disastrous. I know there's an Airprox radio call, but I've yet to see an example on YouTube. Um, that's an interesting one, Dale, actually. I'm going to have a look and see if I can find any information about an Airprox radio call. It's not something I'm aware of, but I'm sure it is in CAP 413, the CAA's radio manual. 
Um, in terms of answering this question, I'm not going to find an Airprox. I've discussed it with uh, my instructor and who is also the guy who owns the aeroplane and he's reviewed the video and we both don't think it was near enough to actually comprise as an Airprox um, and we don't think that anything useful would come of, of filing one either. So I haven't and don't intend to. And unless somebody from the CAA watches this video and says I should fill one in, in which case I obviously would, um, but I don't at this stage think it's something that needs to be done. Um, the final thing really to come on to is uh, what does the other pilot have to say about this? And this is really kind of one of the main interesting parts of this video, I think, because um, he's now got in touch. His name's David Rickwood. He says, hello, Rory. I was the pilot of Delta X-ray routing Gloucestershire to Slape on that date. I did a standard overhead join on the correct runway and crossed the reciprocal numbers overhead at 1,000 feet, as described, and saw you depart whilst executing the join. Um, one of the most interesting things that I think that he says is, uh, what I was not expecting after departure was a turn back onto the downwind on a departure, which is not a manoeuvre I personally executed, always exiting the ATZ before continuing en route. Um, well, I think this is quite interesting because this is just not something that I would do unless I was intending to fly somewhere roughly in the direction that the takeoff was. So in the case of this, we were taking off on runway 18, so we were heading south, and I wanted to fly north back to Barton. So it made sense to me to, as it was a left-hand circuit on the day, make a, a left-hand turn onto crosswind and then a left-hand turn onto downwind, fly the downwind leg and then just continue that until I was outside the ATZ. That's what I've been taught to do um, and that kind of makes sense to me as well. So I'm interested to hear that that's not how David tends to do things. Um, on a, another part of his comment here, he says, as one of the comments has stated, I think a call on joining the downwind after departure would have helped me understand your intentions and therefore given me more situational awareness and time to adjust my join to come in behind you. I mean, I'm a big fan of using the radio. I think we, we communicate on the radio and it helps everybody to be safer and to understand what's going on and where everybody else is. And I'd heard some, some really good calls from David you know, in the overhead and descending dead side and what have you. So I was aware that he was in the area. I was aware that he was joining the circuit and I was looking out for him. Um, so, you know, we were we were already doing well, in a sense, in, in that area. But it's a fair point that it would have been helpful to him. And given that I hadn't yet seen him, and therefore he probably hadn't seen me, it would have been something useful to do. So I accept that, and that's that's been kind of added to my memory bank of things to, to, to do for next time. And then the final bit, particularly, that's really interesting from David. He says, um, from my viewpoint, I should have perhaps uh, taken earlier action to adjust my course to come onto the downwind behind you, but I suspect the uncertainty of your intentions and my unfamiliarity with the action of an aircraft making a downwind join after takeoff for departure without that intention being called on the RT made me hesitate until I was sure of your course. So it sounds like David was basically hedging his bets until he could see exactly what I was doing and then he was going to make a, a decision to come behind me. And I understand that kind of mentality too. So that's all kind of useful feedback. I've replied to David to thank him primarily for getting in touch and um, I've offered to buy him a cup of tea if I see him in an airfield sometimes so hopefully I'll bump into you in, in some some shape or form in the future David and we can have a bit of a chat then but I really appreciate you getting in touch and of course I really appreciate all of you guys for um, commenting on this video and messaging me on the Rory on Air Facebook page and all that kind of stuff as well it's been really useful and I'm really glad to see that there's been so much engagement with this so I think at this point, I feel like we've kind of debriefed as much as we can from this. Uh, I hope you found this video useful and interesting. Next time, um, I am back in the air with my wife, Lizzie. We, uh, I saved going to Shobden until she came back from her sabbatical. Um, so our first flight together when she got back from her sabbatical just after my birthday was us flying down to Shobden in the Eurostar and having something in the cafe there and coming back again. So that will be coming shortly here on Rory on Air. And I have just actually got back from spending six weeks in Orkney um, on Ouskerry doing lots of stuff on my parents' sheep farm. So I've been filming quite a lot of that and look forward to bringing you to a sort of series of short videos from that as well coming up. So do hope you'll stick with me. Thank you very much, of course, for watching as always. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment on this video as well. I really appreciate all your support and engagement with it. And um, 
Don't forget, you can buy hoodies and other merch from me as well on Facebook. <laughs> um, yeah, see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Cheers.